The magnificent red deer is Britain's largest wild mammal, and the uplands of Exmoor and the Quantock Hills are home to over 3,000, the greatest concentration of this majestic creature in all England. Using wonderful film and new research into their behaviour, we can paint a superb picture of the year of the deer. Thousands of people, locals as well as tourists, are attracted to the hills just to catch a glimpse of the deer in this wonderful setting. Johnny Kingdom's been following and observing the red deer for many years. He uses a home video camera to capture the most stunning images of the deer in their habitat. He loves filming in the autumn, in some ways the most exciting season of all. First of all, when you go out looking for the deer, the first thing you do is look up in the sky, see which way the wind's blowing. That's very important. And when you're stalking the deer, you get down, you look at the deer, and when the deer chucks the head up, you stay still. But when the deer puts its head down, you don't move then. Because some deer are very crafty, that's why they're a wild animal. They'll put their head down and chuck their head up. And you're moving, they got you. They're not a bit worried about us, look. I'm just lying in the middle of the field, um, studying on my soul, you know. I found this deer wallow, and honestly, the shot I've got, I must show you that. Um, I got in the train, I was here for four and a half hours. Let's see if I... I have put this numbers on the tape. And hoping they'll come up near where it is. This is something like it. The main thing with the wallow is that there, there's ticks on the body, you see, and they go in there, rub all this slurry mud in, and drives the ticks away. But also they go in there in the rutting season, the mating season, in, in October time. That's when the deer can get very nasty. I mean, I've had them chase me up a tree, I've got all sorts. That's your best plan to get a tree, stay up there. Because if they can, if they really get, they can kill you, you see. You'll see a, a calf in October time, very hard for them to go through the winter with spots like that. Back to the wallow again. So she lies down. She rolls. She gets herself all covered in mud and then up she'll jump, look. There you are. And she'll give a good old shake and all that slurry mud comes off. I like this shot. This is, now look at that for a lovely scene. This is a very big stag coming into the wallow now. This is a royal stag. He puts his antlers to the water. That's what he does. He strikes the water. He scents the ground. He's leaving his. He's, this is his territory, and that stag there will claim all those hinds. Well, I've got myself right again the branch, at the trunk of the tree, like this, all camouflaged, just looking out with a camera like this. Just watch the stag very carefully. I made a big mistake. He sees that red light on that camera, oh. the, the, the recording night. Away you go, and just shows it as a wild deer. Now look, all the other ones is just stood there. They saying, what's, what's happened? They wonder what the hell's happening, see, because the big stag's gone. <laughs> when the rutting season comes in October, the stags will get the fight. And what they do, they fight for their fight for their irons, you see. And one stag will have 30, even 30 irons, and not them have more than that. But they'll fight and fight, and they could kill. You get two stags fighting like this, you don't see this very often, you know. You hear them in the woods in the dark. They don't fight in the daytime very much, you see. 
That stag won't come back now. You'll go on to another herd and fight again. Isn't that marvellous? Until recently, there had been hardly any systematic study of the red deer on Exmoor and the Quantock Hills, but that changed in 1993, when a major research project began. The whole study is looking at the impact of, of red deer on mainly the ancient woodlands, but also the the heather moorland and how that regenerates depending on the amount of grazing by deer as well as by sheep. We're also looking at the deer directly to actually study their habitat use. So do sort of direct observations to see how much time they spend in, in different habitats. And we've also tagged a small number of deer with small radio transmitters which are fitted on a collar around their neck, which allows us to track them actually throughout the 24 hours during the day so, so we can actually get night time observations to actually see which habitats they're using at night and most of all just what amount of time they spend actually in the ancient woodlands, how much time they spend feeding on the farmers fields and out on the open moorland. Now just early on in October which is the main month for rutting for the red deer and most of the stags that we've got collared, we've got four, four different stags with transmitters and they were all collared in this area where we are here now on the National Trust Honeycutt Estate. By using the radio transmitters linked to a receiver in his vehicle, Langbein was able to track the deer at close quarters. The actual transmitter is, is fitted to a, to a leather collar, it's just a small, small unit which, uh, which emits the signal, which is just a constant bleeping signal, signal, sort of once a second, just beep, beep, beep. And within the transmitter there's also a small switch called a tilt switch, which if the animal actually goes past the sort of vertical and has its head down on the ground, the transmitter is actually tilted forwards then the actual bleep rate is actually doubled. It's so we can actually tell that it's feeding then. And the signal also varies depending on whether the antenna is directly in line with you or not. So we can tell if they're moving or if they're just resting. And then with the aerial on, on top of the car, which is a directional aerial, which is called a, a Yagi antenna, when you actually point it directly at the animal, that's where the, the signal strength will be loudest. And, and if you point it away, it gets much weaker again. So you can actually establish which direction the signal is coming from. The receiver unit in the, in the car, you can hear the bleeping, but it also shows uh, the, the strength of the signal. And also you can tune in to every animal individually. They've all got separate frequencies, so we all, every animal is obviously identified purely by its frequency on the on there, so you just tune into each animal in turn. The red deer has an extraordinary place in the life of Exmoor. It's one of its most popular attractions for locals as well as visitors. The magnificent head of the stag is everywhere. It adorns the interior of many of Exmoor's pubs. It's to be found even on the publications of the National Park. Seeing the real thing is a lot more tricky, however. But there are tourist safaris, which ferry enthusiastic visitors around the river valleys and moors to spot the herds, albeit from a distance. 
But not everyone comes to the area just to look at the deer. What makes Exmoor and the smaller range of Quantock Hills different is that the deer are hunted by three packs of stag hounds. For the hunters themselves, hunting is far more than just a sport. It's a practical tool, a mechanism for managing and conserving the red deer, a way of culling the numbers to keep the herds under control. Hunting and red deer have been associated with Exmoor since the Norman kings made the area one of their royal forests. The forest was not a wood in the conventional sense, but an area of land where wild deer were preserved for the king and protected by forest law. The boundaries of Exmoor Forest were marked out by Bronze Age barrows, hedges and ditches. One of the most famous locations is Lanaka Bridge. It was a site of the Swainmote Courts which administered forest law. Penalties for taking the king's deer were severe. Over the centuries, forest law was relaxed and the area of the forest reduced until in 1815 it was sold by the government of the day, a case of early privatization. The herds were hunted in the land surrounding the royal forest and towards the end of the 18th century, the parson at Withypool recorded that there were 200 deer. A century later, numbers were put at 1,500, with the local hunt killing 250 a year. Shooting and military activity reduced the herds until the 1950s, but by the late 1980s, it was thought that there were around 2,000. Obviously, if needed censuses, Exmoor wide, which are undertaken partly by the local Exmoor District Deer Management Society and on the Quantocks by the Quantock Deer Management Group. In February each year, Eric Smith plans the deer count on the Quantock Hills. If you start, if you come up, up the road, from the road, and then you come to the forest, you just drift into the forest and you'll find there's a ride that comes all the way up through, mm. all mm. the way through, and you'll pass a pond in here. The deer are feeding in this field here, right. all right? Mm -hmm. And they, they'll come back across the road into your area. Yeah, well, when you get to Dead Woman's Ditch, you just drift along the road to Crocombe Park Gate. Yes. And you will find someone waiting there mm -hmm. to collect in all your counting sheets you and your map. We'll collect them all in, and uh, it's usually just a matter of me coming, going home and having a count up and see what we turned up. Right. right? Mm -hmm. You're probably going to have 30 altogether with Bill Fumes and so on. We're talking about 50 people, really, aren't we, altogether? Well, it's between 40 and 50. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll be out actually counting the deer. So hey, once we've got all this, once you've got all this uh, information, what happens with it then? What's, what's the, the purpose of the, the deer count? Well, the purpose of the deer count is to get a rough idea of the least number of deer on the hill, not the most, mm. because no way can we get an accurate count mm. of the deer on the Quantox. It's the least amount of deer on the Quantox, and it's the least, by obtaining the figures roughly of what sexes, uh, females and males we've got, we can tell roughly what we're going to need to cull next season to maintain the herd the size of what we've counted. What we're hoping to do is that the ratio between hinds and stags is at the moment about five to one. We're hoping to bring it up nearer, something like three to two. Now, in Binkham, Frank and Jack Clapworthy will be in there and they go around there like Greyhounds, they are very fit boys. There's a um, word going around that they want to increase horses and sheep on the hill to uh, manage the habitat. To me, that's wrong. If a sheep eats the grass, the deer can. So if you bring sheep in here, you're going to push more deer down off the hill looking for food. You can't have two animals trying to eat out the same dish. It won't work. You all right? Yeah, 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 yeah we'll come. Because I want you to do the same grain as you done last year, all okay. through um, oh, yeah. the cliffs now. Okay, I'll find the, um, the list and put it in the car. Oh, I don't, don't worry about it, we've aborted this one. Aborted? Have you? Yeah, we'll go, <laughs> we'll go again in um, first week in 
April. Yeah, you don't seem to have a lot of luck, do you? <laughs> if it isn't foggy, <laughs> it's you, isn't it? snowing. This is the people's fault, it is. Yeah, there's a jinx on it, <laughs> I reckon. It's not really when them come, it's yeah. snowing. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for turning up, Eric. I'm Frank, and this is Jack, and yeah, we are twins. I mean, we do a lot of slideshows, and people say you look very similar, so we tell them we had the same mother, but. Try and also promote our style of photography that you need to wear camouflage. But to photograph nature, you've got to be at one with it. You can't wear, if you're a woman like Chanel and shampoos and pinks and the wrong coloured clothing, because you've got to be able to merge with the environment. Yeah. Well, we've been photographing for, for several years, but we decided to take it seriously when we were working on a, on a building site in Taunton. And, we, and Frank met a chap and he'd photographed a large herd of red deer stags. And when we looked at it, we thought, cool, you know, we liked the animal. And we thought, great, and this is what, you know, it was a difficult subject to do. And we thought, that's it, we'll do it and see how good we get at it. Now, in the winter, the conditions get bad, which means that the stags will, will, and come to that, the red deer hinds will come down into the valleys to seek shelter from the, the bad conditions. Because we do slideshows throughout the whole of Somerset, if you get shots like these, people sort of sit there, you hope, in awe of what you've achieved. And also it's to pr promote the animal, because it's the largest British mammal, it's the only one that's left. You know, and it's, well, we hope that in what we do, we're achieving some beneficial side for the red deer. The deer are so good at seeing things that unless you have like a, a dark coloured camera, then yeah. the, if it, anything shines, they'll pick it up. And the other thing, I mean, I haven't done it on this one, but you've got to tape everything, because any slight noise, mm. they'll pick it up. and they'll pick it up. Mm. Well, I have got a camera that I actually painted camouflage, but the trouble was they put it down once and just took a few steps, and when I turned around, I couldn't find you it. You lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and so we know you know what, you know is, what they're so. doing there, do you? <laughs> The sex act is very brief. <laughs> the stags don't get their own way, and this stag ran into the... And then she ran her head across his back, and then when he wanted to do it, she ran off, so nothing's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, that is the famous white hind of the Quantocks. She's not an albino, she's not pure white. She hasn't got pink eyes. She's got brown on her bottom, and on her thighs at the front and the back. I knew that because she was white, and that obviously all deer are going to die at some time, that I had to get the, the most shots I could of her. So I suppose in a way I got slightly obsessed with her, but because she was the only one, I wanted to get her on film so that if anything did happen to her, that I would have good, you know, recollections and records of her, you know. And she was poached locally. I mean, it's... I don't think the people that did it, I don't think they did it on purpose, I think it was an accident, but saying that, it's still wrong, poaching is still wrong. I mean, we, we would ironically make good poachers, wouldn't we? Yeah. But we wouldn't do it, would we? Well, no, there's no point. <laughs>